at the other individual who is bent on evil. He doesn't care for any good. He rejects every truth. And he looks at him and he says, mm, I like him. You will go to paradise. Now, that is arbitrary. That is arbitrary. Allah's grace does not function that way. That's what the Christians believe in. That Muslims do not believe in. Yes, our deeds do have a role to play. Our deeds do have a role to play. And Allah's grace is manifest through the deeds. Meaning that Allah in His mercy multiplies the good deeds. And He holds the evil deeds as one for one. As He said in Surah Ali Imran verse 160, Whoever brings a good deed, man ja'a bil hasana, will have the value of ten like it. فَلَهُ عَشْرُ أَمْثَالِهَا And whoever brings an evil deed وَمَنْ جَاءَ بِسَيِّئَةِ will only be punished with one like it فَلَا يُجْزَى إِلَّا مِثْلَهَا وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ And they will not be wronged. So Allah multiplies the value of the good deeds. Meaning, if Allah were to hold us deed for deed one good deed, one evil deed. One good deed, one evil deed. No one would make it to paradise. But because he multiplies the good, so that the good deeds, as Allah said, إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ So the good deeds erase evil deeds. This is how the grace of Allah is manifest in our lives. And it is through that grace that those of us who enter paradise will enter paradise. <clears throat> so, as I said, in the creation is manifest a variety of Allah's names and attributes. The creation is there because of His attribute of being the Creator. In the creation is manifest His mercy, His wisdom, His love, His grace, His justice, etc., etc. Now in terms of questions that may be asked, this much we know about Allah's purpose. If someone were to then ask beyond the issue of why did Allah create and that in it is manifest his attributes and somebody then asked instead why did Allah manifest his attributes through his creation this is a question we cannot ask this is Allah's choice he chose to do it this way this is his choice we cannot question that choice and this is where people going into this element now can go astray. And as the Prophet ﷺ warned us, uh, reflect on the creation of Allah, but do not reflect on Allah. Don't get too deep in trying to understand Allah. We can understand what He has revealed to us and stop there. As Abu Huraira narrated, the Prophet ﷺ said, Satan will come to every one of you and ask, who created this, who created that? Until he questions who created your Lord. When he comes to that, one should seek refuge in Allah and say, I affirm my faith in Allah and his prophets and should avoid such thoughts. So we need to know our limitations. We understand you know, relative to Allah's attributes. Uh, the creation is a means of manifestation of Allah's attributes. That's what he chose, not because he needs to, because, but because... He chose to manifest it in that way. <clears throat> now we come to the original question. Why did Allah create human beings? Meaning, for what purpose did Allah create human beings? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers that question in no uncertain terms in Surah al dhariyat verse 56, in which He said, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنْسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ 
I've only created the jinn and humankind to worship me. That's the bottom line. Now, of course, the next question that people would ask, why did Allah create human beings to worship him? It's not because he was hidden treasure and he wanted to be discovered like the Sufis say. So then why? Why did Allah make our purpose that of worship? Is it because Allah needs our worship? Of course not. Allah does not need our worship. If all of, the, of humankind worshipped Allah, He would not be increased in any way. If all of humankind refused to worship Allah, He would not be decreased in any way. So, that purpose of worship is not established out of a need which Allah has. Obviously then, it is a need which human beings have. Allah made that our purpose because that is a need which we have. We were created initially in paradise, placed in paradise. And that is where our end is supposed to be. The way to get there is through the worship of Allah. So worship is a means which Allah has given us to help us get back to the place for which we were created. Now, one may ask the question, what then is the meaning of worship in Islam? Because worship uh, is an old English uh, term which means to honor. Therefore, when one honors a thing, it is referred to as worshipping that thing. Movie stars are referred to as movie idols. You know, people honor them. They make pictures of them, put them on their walls. You know, their, their reverence that they hold for them becomes a form of worship. However, from the Islamic perspective, worship, though it involves honor, it goes beyond that. It involves honor and glorification as we find in the verse, فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ فَسَبِّحْ This is glorify the praises of your Lord. So the idea of glorifying God, honoring Him, this is a part of worship. But all of the creation is involved in that. Allah says the seven heavens and the earth and what is in them glorify him. And there is nothing which does not glorify his praise. However, you do not understand their glorification. So this is something which all of human and non-human existence is involved in anyway. When we go to look at the issue of worship from the Islamic perspective, we need to go to the Arabic the Arabic term for worship is what? Ibadah. And Ibadah, this term Ibadah comes from an Arabic term which is Abd. Which means slave. Slave. So the concept of Ibadah is rooted in the concept of servitude, of being a slave. So the, the worship of Allah is fundamentally submitting to the will of Allah. That's the essential meaning of worship. Submitting to the will of Allah. And this we can find in the distorted scriptures of the Christians. We can still find it there in Matthew 7.21 where Jesus is quoted there as saying, None of those who call me Lord will enter the kingdom of God but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Doing the will of God. This is the essence of worship. Doing the will of God. Now, doing the will of God is basically 
obeying God's commands. This is where the will of God is manifest in the instructions which He has given. Whether it's in the Torah, whether it's in the Injil, whether it's in the Quran, or the other books of Revelation, the instructions which Allah has given, this is the expression of His will. What does Allah will for us to do? What does He wish for us to do? That in fulfilling what Allah has asked of us, in this lies the worship of Allah. As also quoted, can be quoted from the scripture, in spite of his distorted form, we can hear echoes of that. In Matthew 19, 16 and 17, Now behold, one came and said to him, to Jesus, Good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. He distinguishes himself from God. But if you want to enter into life, eternal life, keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. And in Matthew 5, 19, Jesus is also quoted as saying, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches you men to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So fulfillment of God's commandments, this is the essence of worship. Obeying what God has instructed. Now some people say, well, <clears throat> isn't it better? Ya Hamukullah. Isn't it better to worship God when you feel the desire than to worship Him at these fixed times, you Muslims, you know, the Fajr, the Zuhur, the Asr, the Maghrib and the Isha. Isn't it better to worship God when you feel that desire within yourself? When you really want to reach out to Him? When there is true sincerity there, isn't that better than to worship Him at these fixed times? You know, the common question which is raised. And when we think about it, one has to admit, yeah, it is better that when we worship God, you know, it is really truly from our heart. And that is better than worshiping God just out of the ritual, doing it because at the time that he said so in theory so then why did Allah prescribe five times daily prayer this is the question we need to ask the point is that if we worship God only when we feel this sincere desire to reach out to him right when's that gonna happen once in a day, once in a week, once in a month, maybe once in a year. Maybe years may go by and we never have this desire, so we don't worship God. And when is it that people really worship God sincerely? When is it? When the calamity strikes, right? This is the time when people are there, oh Allah, help me now, I need your help. You know, they're pouring their hearts out. When the calamity strikes. But the reality is that those who worship Allah only when the calamity strikes are no different than the Kafirs who when calamity strikes them even though they said there is no God. There is no God. But when that Kafir finds himself, that disbeliever finds himself in that 747 40,000 above the earth. He looks out the window and he sees one of the engines fall off. And the plane starts to go into this death dive. He knows there's nowhere out. What does he do? Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. You know? There it's coming from the depths of his soul. He's calling out to God. Because nothing else is going to save him now. right? So what's the difference in the essence between him and the Muslim who only calls on God when calamity strikes. 
It's no difference. In essence, there is no difference. That is why we have five times daily prayer prescribed. So others will say, well, okay, what about though if I pray, you know, a couple of times a day or, you know, Fridays, Juma, you know, I'm a Juma Muslim or I'm a Ram Ramadan Muslim, okay, Ramadan comes along, I'm in the masjid making up for the rest of the year. Or I do this thing which they call Juma Til Wida. You know, I was given some teachings about Ramadan and the things of Ramadan and in the course of the class one of the sisters from Pakistan she asked me what about Juma Til Wida? you didn't mention that one I said Juma Til Wida? I never heard of that one oh, what, what is Juma Til Wida? so she went on to explain that Juma Til Wida is the last Juma in Ramadan right if you catch this last Juma in Ramadan it makes up for all the prayers that you missed all year. Well, I said, I, I know about, you know, Tawaf al you know, the final Tawaf before you leave Mecca, and Hajjat al the farewell pilgrimage of the Prophet, but Jumat al I'm sorry, I can't find that one anywhere. Never came across it. It's been invented by Muslims, unfortunately, you know, as a way out, right? You don't need to pray all year long. Just make sure you catch Juma till Wida. That last Friday in Ramadan and you're covered. Right? So what about the Ramadan Muslim or the Friday Muslim? He, he or she only comes to the masjid or only prays on Fridays. Or once in a while during the week they might make a, fa uh, a Dhuhr. Fajr no no. Fajr is too much. But Dhuhr maybe or or Asr or whatever what about these people these people basically what they are practicing is what we call precautionary worship hmm? what is precautionary worship precautionary worship is for those people who are really not sure there is an Allah out there right but they say just in case just in case there is Allah at least I got a few worships here to you know I can say well Allah, I go here, I did do some Fridays, you know, I did pray once in a while, so, you know, what about this? Does this carry me? Does this help me? You know, precautionary worship. But of course, this is useless. This is useless. To worship Allah just in case, yes, this is not worship. Worshipping Allah has to be based on belief in Allah. Certainty of that belief, that there is Allah. This is the worship of Allah. Anything less than that is useless. It's ritual. And the ritual, as they say, will not take us to paradise. Ritual will not take us to paradise. Following the ritual which has been prescribed sincerely, yes, that will take us to paradise. So sincerity has to be there. Certainty of belief has to be there. Prayer in accordance with the way of the Prophet ﷺ has to be there. When Jesus said, supposedly, I am the truth, the way, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. What Jesus was speaking about, if that was truly his words, is when he said, I am the way, not that you pray through me, you pray to me, no. That I am on the way. You want to get to God, you got to follow the way that I am on. And that was what all of the prophets taught. They taught their people that they had to follow their way. As Prophet Sallallahu taught, you've got to follow my way. That is what we call the sunnah. This is the way. It's essential. So when we're going to worship Allah, we have to worship Allah in accordance with the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a requirement. This is a requirement for each and every one of us. For worship to be acceptable, it has to be in accordance with the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We spoke about that earlier. Why? Because he taught us all of the ways of worship.
As he said, I've left nothing which will bring you closer to Allah without instructing you to do it. مَا تَرَكْتُ شَيْئًا يُخَرِّبُكُمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ إِلَّا وَأَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ There is nothing, there is no way that we can bring about which is pleasing to Allah which Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has not already told us to do it. As Imam Malik said, when the verse, Al-Yawma Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum Today I have perfected for you, completed for you, your religion. When that verse was revealed, whatever was religion then, was is and always will be religion. And whatever was not religion at the time that that verse was revealed, can never be religion. The religion was complete with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, we have to worship Allah as He prescribed for us with sincerity, certainty of His uh, existence, following the Sunnah, the way of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and also understanding that way according to the explanations given to us by the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They best understood what was intended by the Quran and by the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because they were there. They were guided by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So their understanding is the best understanding. So today for us to try to give interpretations and explanations which contradict those understandings, this is in error. This is in error. This is misguidance. And this is, in, this is critical, this is important for us to preserve the correct understanding of Islam. Yes, Islam is based on the Quran and Sunnah. But according to whose understanding? The understanding of the best of generations. As the Prophet ﷺ said, the best of people are my generation. Then those who followed them, then those who followed them. So, Allah prescribed worship for us. To help us get back to paradise. And the essential goal of worship is none other than the remembrance of Allah. As Allah said, Inni ana Allahu la ilaha illa ana fa'budni wa aqimis salah li dhikri. Indeed, I am Allah. There is no God beside me. So worship me and establish regular prayer for my remembrance because in the remembrance of Allah we are protected from evil in the forgetfulness of Allah then the door is open for evil if we consider the prohibition on gambling and uh, intoxicants we find Allah saying, Satan's plan is to incite enmity and hatred among you with intoxicants and gambling and hinder you from the remembrance of Allah and regular prayer. Will you not then abstain? Allah describes those who went astray following the parties of Satan, Hizbus Shaitan. You know, he says there, Satan got the better of them and caused them to forget Allah. Those are the party of Satan. Inna hizbas shaytani humus khasirun. And truly, the party of Satan are the real losers. So Satan is able to get to us when we forget Allah. And so, whenever we commit sins, whenever we have gone astray, Whenever we've done wrong, then Allah encourages us 
to remember him and get ourselves back in order. As he said in uh, the third chapter, verse 135, those, describing the true believers, those who having done something shameful or having wronged their own souls, remember Allah and immediately ask forgiveness for their sins. This is the quality or the attribute of the true believers. So the goal of salah, the goal of fasting, the goal of zakah, the goal of Islam is to help us to remember Allah. Because in the remembrance of Allah, we submit to Allah's commandments and we get on that path, the path inshallah to paradise. Now, from the Islamic perspective, <clears throat> worship is life. Worship encompasses all aspects of life. As Allah tells us to say in our prayers, Qul inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. Say, Surely my prayer, my sacrifice, my living and dying are for Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. So all of a Muslim's life should be transformed into worship. Meaning that everything we do, we do it in the remembrance of Allah, sincerely for the sake of Allah, in accordance with, with the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this is why we need to have knowledge of Islam. This is why Prophet Muhammad made the seeking of knowledge compulsory. Talabul ilmi farida ala kulli Muslim. Seeking knowledge is compulsory for every Muslim. So that we, through that knowledge, may transform our lives into worship. All aspects of our lives. This is the goal. And this is the way. And it is in following this way that we then achieve the status of being the best of creation. About whom Allah says in Surah Al-Bayyina, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَّةِ Indeed, those who believe and do righteous deeds are the best of creation. This is what takes us to that state where we do not remember Allah and obey His commands then Allah describes us as being kal an'am bel hum adal we are like cattle in fact we are more misguided and because of the fact that the remembrance of Allah worshipping Allah is the essence of our purpose of creation then whatever cancels that where we are worshipping other than Allah's creation this must be the worst possible sin we can commit this is why shirk is the gravest of all sins because it negates the very purpose of our creation this is why it is the greatest of evils. And this is why when we said before, when we weigh M Mother Teresa's good deeds and her shirk, the shirk outweighs her good deeds. Because good deeds, what we perceive as good deeds, may be done for a variety of reasons. People do good for a variety of reasons. And it is only those who truly believe in Allah that do good for the right reasons. You find people do good as long as it is convenient. You have somebody who doesn't even believe in God at all. But they will do good because it is convenient. When doing good is no longer convenient, then they'll stop doing it. Or they may do good 
because it gives them an in to people. They've done you a favor, so you are now obligated to them. So they do good in order to oblige you to do them favors. People do good for, as I said, for a variety of different reasons. And that's why the ultimate good is to believe in Allah as He deserves to be believed and to worship Allah as He deserves to be worshipped. <clears throat> now, in terms of our purpose with regards to our existence in this world, somebody may ask, why did Allah create humankind on the earth? And Allah explained that. Further, in the 67th chapter, verse 2, Allah said there, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ It is he who created death and life to test which of you is best in conduct. And he is the mighty the forgiving. So our creation in this world is a part of a test. A test which is there to bring out of us the highest of the spiritual qualities that the human being may possess. For example, generosity and contentment. These are two great qualities that everybody recognizes as being worthy of striving for. A person who is truly generous is a noble human being. People everywhere in all societies honor such individuals. A person who is content, people strive for contentment. But they strive for it through money because they think that money and material uh, being will bring them happiness happiness is contentment you're happy with the state that you're in but the reality is that Prophet ﷺ said true wealth is not having a lot of property true wealth is spiritual contentment this is where the true wealth lies. And Allah deliberately favored some human beings over others. As He said, وَاللَّهُ فَضَّلَ بَعْضَكُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ فِي الرِّزْقِ And Allah has favored some of you over others in sustenance. And He has given us women, children, wealth as a part of the test. وَعَلَمُوا Know that your wealth and children are a test. Elsewhere he said, So do not allow your wealth and children to divert you from the remembrance of Allah. They are a test. The test of what we do with what Allah has given us. Recognizing that whatever wealth, whatever property we have, this is ultimately from Allah. This is not the product of our hard work, you know, as people sometimes like to look at it. You know, I'm doing well, I'm living good because of my hard work. Those people are poor and destitute because they're lazy. Hey, that's a lie. If wealth were the direct consequence of hard work, then the poorest people on the earth would be the richest. That individual who gets up in the early morning from the rise of the sun and goes out and he plows those fields until there's no more light in the day. He comes home, he eats, he's so exhausted all he can do is fall to sleep. Don't tell me that the individual who sits, you know, in the 50th story of this high rise who just signs papers, he comes in a couple of days a week and the papers are brought, he signs it, puts a stamp on it and goes out that he is more hard working than an individual. No way. Wealth 
is something which Allah grants people. And we need to recognize it as part of the test. Because generosity can only grow, can only develop where some people have more than others. If everybody had exactly the same amount, how can you be generous? Who are you going to give to? Generosity cannot exist unless there is poverty, unless there is states where people have less than others. That's the only way generosity can come into being. So Allah has put others with less than us to test us, will we share what we have with others? He has ob obliged us to give zakah as a training to do sadaqah. That we will voluntarily give from our wealth for the sake of Allah. And on the other hand, we are told not to look at those above us. Because in looking at them, we will become discontent. Therefore, we should look at those below us. Because no matter what situation we may be in, there will always be people who have less than us, who are worse off than us. So as the Prophet ﷺ said, look to those below you. Not to those above you. Because in looking to those below you, it helps you to remember Allah's favor on you and you become content. Otherwise, as he said, if a man had a valley of gold, he would desire another. For nothing will fill his mirth mouth but the dirt of his grave. And Allah forgives those who sincerely repent. If a man had a valley of gold, he would desire another. In America they say, the grass is always greener on the other side. Same thing. Same concept. That is the nature of human beings. Never satisfied. So the person who has all the wealth, possible that person you wonder why are they doing these crazy things you see people who are the richest individuals amongst us the movie stars the sports stars all, and their lives are just filled with all kinds of craziness drugs and you know Elton John homosexuality and you know, all this kind of stuff that is out there you wonder how in the world people they have all this wealth because there is no contentment in wealth. If one doesn't understand the purpose of wealth, then you can't find contentment. The more you have is the more you want. And when you have things, you start to look at people suspiciously. When you didn't have anything, well, you know, everybody was all right, somebody smiles at you, no problem, you smile back at them. Once you have, you won the sweepstake, you're now a millionaire, Everybody who smiles at you say, well, what does he want? You know, what does she want? They want my money. That's why they're smiling. You know, you change. You become suspicious of everybody around you. You can't find contentment in it. There is no contentment. So, ultimately, these trials are there to develop us. For us to develop spiritually. Similarly, those people who are at the bottom... Those people who don't have, who have less, etc. In that situation, we develop contentment if we deal with it correctly. If we recognize what Allah has given us, then we can be content with what we have. We don't feel bound to keep up with the Joneses, you know, as they say. Keeping up, well, the neighbor's got a new car, we have to have a new car. The neighbor got a this, we have to have a that. So and so at school, she has this. Oh, I must have that also. You know, these kids come home, they tell the parents, you know, so and so got a new this, and why can't I have one? I want to have one. This wanting what everybody else has. That contentment comes out of realizing that whatever one has, there's a blessing in it. We have more than others. When a person realizes that, then they can find contentment. And they can worship Allah as he deserves to be worshipped. And this is one of the well-known characteristics of the Muslims. I remember reading an article 
Now uh, it had a picture on it. Uh, it was in Somalia during the, the war in Somalia. Civil war where people were killing each other and starvation, all these kind of things. All the warlords were fighting it. Then they had this picture of these American soldiers who had converted to Islam. They had built a little masjid. They were sitting in, in the front foreground. They were taking their boots off to go make wudu. And um, the author of the article, he was asking one of them, a captain, you know, how, why did you accept Islam in the middle of all of this? This is the worst possible example of Muslims, you know, or what Islam is to be given. Here are Muslims at each other's throats, people are dying of starvation because of this, you know, brutality and all this other kind of thing. And you became Muslim. Well, what the captain said, he said, hey, you know what? In spite of the tragedy which exists here, I found that these people could still smile. They could still be happy with simple things. He said, when I consider myself going to work on the subway in New York in the morning, and you look at the faces of the richest people on the earth, you see in them tragedy. Their faces are twisted in pain, you know, going to work each day, another day. You know, people don't lighten up until Friday, right? All during the week, they're, oh, it's a pain at work, you know. And this is, these are the richest people on the earth. They can't smile. So he said, this is what struck him and drew him to Islam. And that is that thing of contentment. People being able to deal with difficulties in life. Knowing that, of course, there are greater difficulties in other people's life. Knowing that there is good behind it, even though we can't see it. We spoke about earlier. The calamities. As Allah said, in our lives we have calamities. And those calamities serve primarily to bring out the quality of patience. Sabr. Sabr, which is one of the keys to success in this life. As Allah said in Surah Al-Asr, when He said that all of humankind is in a state of loss. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Except for those who believe وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ and do righteous deeds وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ And they advise each other to be truthful in truth. وَتَوَاصَوْ sabr, And they advise each other to be patient. Patience. This is key. This is the basis for success. So trials are there to bring out this quality of patience. The key quality for success in this life. And we should know that those who are most righteous receive the greatest amount of trials. As the Prophet ﷺ said, when he was asked by his companions, who receives the most trials in this life? And the Prophet ﷺ said, the prophets. Then those most like them. Then those most like them. Human beings are tested according to the level of their faith. If the individual's faith is firm, his trials increase in severity. And if there is weakness in his faith, he will be tried accordingly. So the calamities of each and everyone's lives are tailored to their faith. What is needed to increase that faith, to grow in patience. The calamities are there for that. That is the fundamental purpose of calamities in our lives. However, to grasp that, to develop that patience, one has to know that Allah does not burden any soul beyond its capacity. As Allah tells us, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا This is the basic principle. We know that it means that whatever tragedy comes to us, it is not greater than we can bear. We do not kill ourselves because we can't deal with life. It is too much. We don't support 
mercy killing because mercy killing is murder that's what it is it's just plain out and out murder or suicide suicide is forbidden in Islam just like murder a person who is suffering when a person doesn't believe in this world that there is a God etc for him or her this life is about pleasure we are here to have a good time so if life is no longer pleasurable what's the purpose of being here my life is painful I may as well end it that's a whole nother philosophy this is the way of those who don't believe in God Islam teaches that calamities tragedies are means and ways of purifying the individual of his or her sin as Prophet ﷺ said for the believer if he or she steps on a thorn that removes from them some sin if they step on a thorn it removes from them sin if they are patient with it right not if you curse you step on the thorn and you curse and this is why for example if a person they're walking and they trip stumble you don't laugh at people you know this is a tendency amongst us somebody stumbles over trips over their feet or whatever and everybody starts laughing no I mean we should feel sympathetic and we should again know if that person is patient with that accident or whatever it's purification when we meet people who are suffering in, in, in uh, illness etc this is purification so we say as the Prophet ﷺ taught us to say Tuhurun insha'Allah may this be a source of purification from your sins insha'Allah very very important concept I know personally after I accepted Islam in 1972 and I went down to Jamaica because that's where I was born looking to see if there were any Muslims I went of course to see my relatives try to give Islam to them those who are living still living in Jamaica and I wanted to see if there are any Muslims down there so my cousins told me hey there's a mosque in downtown Kingston I said yeah take me to it I went there and it was this huge structure with this big dome over it I went close ah a Baha'i temple <laughs> it wasn't a masjid they just assume that if you got a dome on it, it's got to be a mosque, right? But unfortunately, it was a Baha'i temple. So I kept asking around till finally I found a masjid, a little masjid in Spanish town. And uh, it had been built by this brother who was originally, his four parents had come there uh, from India. And they had maintained their Islam from the time of slavery on down. And he had set aside a portion of his land and built a masjid there and from his dealing with other Jamaicans etc people impressed by his kindness his gentleness they had accepted Islam he was a little source of a Muslim community right there but when I came and I met him he was dying of cancer his body was cancer ridden it had hit you know the major organs and he was suffering serious pain he couldn't make it to the masjid we would be in the masjid and we would hear him trying to control it but you know it would cause him to scream out couldn't control it pain was so severe and at the time because of course I was a new Muslim I just accepted Islam it just seemed wow you know this man had done this good thing and look how he was going look what was happening to him and that remained something that bothered me you know how he would be suffering like that and you know he had been such a key figure in Islam coming to that area establishing the masjid then later I came to realize the purification of pain purification that is there in pain suffering in disease calamity and I realized then that Allah 
was purifying this man. As Prophet ﷺ said, when Allah loves his servants, he will put tragedy on that individual so that he or she will leave this life purified of sin. It's a means of purifying them so they come out of this life pure. And this is why we should understand, you know, some of us when we think about our brother, Sheikh Ahmed Didat, you know, who was involved in the da'wah yeah. of tackling the Christians. No matter how much we may disagree with his methodology, it may not be that appropriate for giving da'wah on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but he was one of the individuals who stood up there and challenged Christianity on the stage. You know, challenge their leading spokesmen, etc., etc. He was doing his jihad. And then, ten years ago or less, he was struck down by a stroke, which made him a paraplegic. The only thing he could move is his eyelids. Of course, for the Christian you know, evangelist, see, God got him. Right? Hey, this is how they looked at it. And of course, we felt, hmm. But if we think about it also, this is the trial, this is the test for our brother, Ahmed Didat. This is his purification. Because he made mistakes like everybody else. And Allah is purifying him as he leaves. He hasn't given up. He still communicates. They devise, they set up where they have a computer screen and the keyboard and his son will move a marker over the keyboard and when he hits the letter which Ahmed Didat wants he gives a signal with his eye whatever and he presses that key and he's still writing letters giving the dawah conveying even in that state so you know we should feel happy for him though it's a tragedy. It is, as I said, a means of purification. And this is the way of the believer. His or her life, as the Prophet ﷺ said, is a blessed thing. All aspects of the believer's life is a blessed thing. And this is only in the case of the true believer. He said, whenever good comes to them, they are thankful to Allah, and Allah rewards them for it. And whenever calamity strikes them, they are patient with Allah and Allah rewards them for it. This is the case of the true believer. But for the disbeliever, for those who have rejected Allah, then calamity is punishment. It is punishment. Because they can't understand why. It's just punishment. For the believer, it is purification. Or... It is a wake-up call. When you listen, when you read the, the reasons why Muslims wake up, you know, you hear of certain brothers or sisters who weren't practicing before, you know, all of a sudden they turn around and they start to practice that deen as best as they could. Oftentimes it's tragedy. Tragedy strikes. Calamity strikes. And it's a wake-up call for them. They stop and they think. Or people who are non muslims you know, living that life. And then calamity strikes. It woke, woke them up. And they came back to Allah. So, for the believers, those seeking truth, then it is a reminder, a wake-up call. As Allah said, I will make them taste a lesser punishment before the greater punishment that perhaps they may return to the right path. This is a mercy from Allah when we get these wake up calls but as I said for the disbeliever it is punishment as Allah said let those who contradict his command be aware beware of a trial or a severe punishment beware of a trial which will not afflict only the sinful among you and know that Allah is severe in punishment and also it is a means of exposing the hypocrites those who claim to be believers, Allah brings calamity to expose them. Their hypocrisy will be revealed. 
So you find people who may do, as the Prophet ﷺ say, said, the deeds of the people of paradise throughout their lives. Until they reach only a bow's length away from paradise, then they start doing the deeds of the people of hell and they die doing those deeds. These are people who did the deeds of para people of paradise out of ritual. They did it because it was the custom, the practice in our area, in our family, whatever, we all did it. But they really didn't believe. So Allah gives them a circumstance where they're going to react and expose their hypocrisy. You know, either tragedy comes and you see them just drop Islam altogether, finish. Or good times come and they drop Islam altogether, finish. These people, sometimes people, when others are on their deathbed, and that person is on his way out of this life and the Prophet ﷺ said that you should recite to those who are dying recite to them, have them say La ilaha illallah Have them say La ilaha illallah 